It is April the 27th, 2021, and this is Curious Nicola. Henry, how are you today? I'm great as almost always. How are you? It's almost always. Um, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Um, whenever I can record an episode with you, I'm good. So. Oh, thank you. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, before we get into uh, the episode, we of course have a topic to talk about. We have a newsreel. Um, we have to start with a, a rather sad um, piece of news because a dear friend is no longer with us. <sighs> he enjoyed traveling in the Antarctic. He was not always very concentrated. He often was a bit scattered all over the place. Um, but that was one of the reasons we uh, we really liked him. So we often talked about him here on this show and he will always be remembered as a wonderful friend. I'm, of course, talking about A68. My friend, our favorite iceberg, we will miss you. I think that was appropriate, right? Very much, it was a very much appropriate. A68 <laughs> is gone. Our favorite iceberg is no longer officially an iceberg. Tell us what happened there. The, the iceberg disintegrated. So we have like, a, you, we followed the iceberg over the, the past month, um, pretty much years. I mean, we had a couple of episodes with him. We had like episode 95, I think we started when I um, was talking about Circ uh, not circumnavigating, but cruising along the edge of the iceberg and, and the zodiac. Then we had episode 114, where we just talked about it again, how it approaches South Georgia and uh, might, um, yeah, threaten the ecosystem there. And it came into the stress of the very, very strong Antarctic circumpolar current, which is a very big stress on such a lot, large, humongous iceberg, which is very large in area, but not very thick. And um, yeah, the stress of the currents and the warmer water did its rest, so it disintegrated further and further and further. And um, I think the 15th of April was um, the day when the National Snow and Ice Data Center in Colorado just decided that the size, the area of the iceberg is not large enough any longer to track it any further. It's, it's kind of... Well, it's a bit sad because I liked I liked it, especially as it was turning into all these smaller pieces. I mean, it's just, uh, yeah, just uh, going through the alphabet was quite fun. Yes, right. <laughs> so, so what we're what we're looking at now is is a, a, a still a bunch of pieces around, right? Yes. That are that are. I think we have a picture here, uh, a bunch of pieces here that are just all too small to be able to 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 fall in, under the definition of what an iceberg is. Yeah, what you can see on that um, black picture here is... In, in the video, um, by the way, for all who are listening, this, again, as, as usual, is <laughs> more of a video episode. So, yeah, there's one there's one small round, uh, one small uh, piece with a red outline. Is that the ma main part that's left? Exactly. So that is the, the, the rest of A68A of the large piece um, that, that, that it used to be. So right. it just broke off quite tremendously. And you can see there is a lot of white area on the right side of A68A, and that's brash. That's a lot of small pieces, a lot oh. of leftovers that's just in the vicinity of it. And that's by far way too small to track, to trace. It still is quite significant in, in size. It might be still in, uh, provide some very nice icebergs for some beautiful pictures, but it's just not uh, large enough to be traced any longer. Okay, so yeah, icebergs tend to go away. Um, here, uh, the BBC uh, news piece that we have here also says or asks, is climate change to blame? How about that question? Uh, no, certainly not. So scientists are very, very sure that um, A68A was like a natural cause, and that's kind of the life cycle of ice shelves. So ice shelves um, are formed by ice flows, by glaciers coming down from the mountains and going um, onto the sea and create the, the floating platform. And when those um, ice streams are coming down from the mountains, they already have some 
uh, cracks and crevasses and cracks in there. Um, and those uh, cracks are just like the, the result of the stress of the motion of, of the ice. And even though the platform um, floats on the ice, you will have that uh, those kind of lines on top of it. A satellite picture will actually show that uh, quite clearly. And those are quite uh, predetermined um, breaking lines where a uh, possible iceberg can just form at any time. And what was then um, clearly visible, scientists were expecting the iceberg to form much, much earlier. And we actually um, saw a similar thing happening on the Brunt Ice Shelf and other uh, episodes where the Halley Station is, the research station from the, from the Brits. Um, here on Larsen Ice Shelf, um, we could actually follow the extension of that crack, how that crack uh, grew larger and larger and larger and eventually gave the iceberg free. And even then, after the iceberg um, officially broke off, it stayed almost in place for, for quite some time, a year, before it then um, moved out of the place, uh, it, you know, turned uh, around, made a 360-degree um, circle just around its own axis before it then got uh, taken off from the ocean currents of the Waddell Sea and uh, pushed into the Antarctic circumpolar current. Yeah. All right. So, so no climate change. A sixty eight A. You were a wonderful friend. And on to the next piece in our newsreel. Um, Internet in the Arctic. How about that? What's going on there? That's pretty awesome. So uh, Russia actually um, connects. Now, the Asian part of the Arctic, uh, like the far east, uh, Vladivostok and the area around there, um, with a high-speed internet cable, a fiber optic cable, six-pair fiber optic cable, um, with roughly 12,650 kilometer length from Murmansk at the Kola Peninsula all the way uh, over to the east to Vladivostok. It's called Polar Express, and of course, it's not intrinsic. It's not that they just build it for the few scattered people living around there, mm. but it's supposed to support the Northern Sea Route here and provide a stable, reliable internet connection for the businesses, for the um, gas and oil uh, terminals in the area. So I think that's the main driver here. Anyhow... Um, it's supposed to be a subground sea cable. So it's yeah, quite they dig, some, they dig some, it into the seafloor, right? Exactly. So it's quite some effort the Russians are taking here with nine ships um, yeah, laying down that cable on the ocean floor or below the right. ocean floor all the way to the east. Uh -huh. and I, th I find it interesting how, the, uh, how, how different approaches are working on bringing internet to remote areas and of course laying a cable is kind of the traditional approach uh, used to be the old satellite internet which is very expensive and uh, satellites are so far out that you have like a few seconds of delay when you want to do like a phone call over it uh, and now new things like starlink are coming on the on the horizon that will well not quite the arctic just yet but in the future also will cover the arctic and will bring connectivity there with a simple satellite antenna so it, yeah, interesting so it, what, what's happening particular there. for those remote areas in the high arctic that will be kind of the future because uh, laying those cables is tremendously um it's expensive, expensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, the satellite connections might be um a cheaper solution in the long run there so yeah i'm, I'm really curious how that goes cool and last but not least a piece of um politics what's going on in greenland Oh, yeah. Uh, Greenland had some early elections after the Prime Minister um, Kim Kielsen uh, resigned and um, a new government was uh, formed. So out of the elections, uh, Inuit Atakatikit, um, the community of the people, just uh, came out as the, um, as the winner and they teamed up with um, another party and form a new government with the youngest ever prime minister in Greenland, 34 years young, uh, Muse Egede, um, yeah, in, in the name tradition of Hans Egede, the uh, f first missionary to uh, Greenland from Denmark. And both governing parties have quite um, a stand in um, speeding up the independence process uh, of Greenland. And the major topic in the campaign was campaigning against the rare earth mine in South Greenland. Uh, 
So and that's probably very interesting geopolitical. Uh, we, we always uh, seem to say Greenland needs uh, the mining, needs the resources to support uh, the independency. And here we have a very, very strong plea. Both parties gained tremendous support here mm -hmm. um, during that campaign with an anti-mining campaign. So, so we are we are looking at a younger prime minister and a supposedly more environmentally leaning uh, government there. Yes. So, um, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. It is. <laughs> All right. Thanks for the news update. Let's dive right in. Uh, <clears throat> Drifting north. What's that all about? We talked a lot in the past month about um, this amazing uh, amazing largest expedition of all times um, the full title is multidisciplinary drifting observatory for the study of arctic climate and you know what i'm talking about and i hope that uh, some of the Hold listeners on. also are talking about mosaic exactly of about mosaic um, we talked about it in in one episode or the other, uh, or the other. We briefly touched it in a number of uh, newsreels. We also briefly touched Feature of Nonsense from Expedition in our episode. Uh, I think it was number seventy. Which was a the, bit of the blueprint for this, right? Exactly. Um, the, the the blueprint for for the Mosaic Expedition. You're completely right. And in last week's episode, we actually learned about where Friedrich Nansen got his idea from. You can see on the map, you can see um, where the Fram was locked into the ice uh, north of the New Siberian Islands. And he aimed for the North Pole, the ship was drifting. And when he figured it's not going uh, right to the North Pole, he decided to leave the Fram and go on a, a dock sludge um, expedition with um, Hjalmar Johansson. And then his equipment failed and uh, forced him to turn around. Um, other than that, that was like a humongous scientific um, gain of that expedition. And the idea for that expedition, uh, Friedrich Nansen got from um, from another expedition. So from from the remains of what we talked about last week, the uh, ill-fighted Genat expedition, because when the Genat actually sank. The remains, or some of the remains, actually traveled all the way to southwest Greenland, where it got washed ashore and got found. And when Friedrich Nansen got um, note of that, he was immediately coming up with the idea there must be something like a transpolar drift. And I would love to study that a little longer. So he went on that uh, three-year expedition with the Fram, and that was then the uh, starting point of uh, that kind of business, if you like. Um. And I'd like to stay with that kind of topic a little longer because I actually think it's not only very fascinating but also in a very large extent unknown to us. So today's episode um, should cast a little light onto an episode of Arctic research that has been largely happening out of sight of the general public. Cool. The, the ice drift of Friedrich Nansen's Fram expedition accumulated an extremely valuable scientific set of data. We're talking about the period between 1893 and 96, so short before the um, turn of the century. And after that, not a single expedition achieved something very, very similar or somewhere close to what um, Nansen did. There was no systematic program of scientific observation in the central Arctic basin. So what he's done there was not only a very much pioneer expedition, it was the last one in a long period of time. However, the, Rus uh, the Russians, they really were intrigued to find out more about the function of the high Arctic, and they wanted to understand um, better if and how they could actually strategically develop the Northern Sea Route. Because for them, they have a large, very long coastline, which in most time of the year, they can't really use. So they would love to understand better how they actually can, can make use of it. And they were interested to find out of the feasibility of an even further north, uh, northern variant of the Northern Sea Route. So in 1934, after the First World War, between First and Second, um, a committee was formed in Soviet Russia. And within 10 days, they reported back with a very, very detailed plan for a high-latitude expedition. 
And that committee that proposed actually an expedition that should initially confine its attention to the western part of the Soviet, Soviet Arctic. So we're talking about the area between the Kola Peninsula, where Momansk is uh, situated, and the Lena Delta, where the Jeanette expedition survivors actually uh, made landfall, if you, you remember. The proposed areas of scientific investigation, so the, the scientific fields actually, they included um, subjects like meteorology, like ice observations, marine biology, physical um, oceanography, and um, last but not least, investigation of uh, seabed sediments. So it's quite a range of scientific observations they uh, aimed for. And the first instance, um, it was intended that the expedition uh, should leave um, in the 1934 season, but for a number of reasons, uh, they never made it. Primarily, uh, primarily because there was no suitable ship um, available at the time. The year later, in 1935, however, um, the Soviet Union could get a hold of the ice-breaking steamer Satko, and um, the ship was put into sea towards the end of June with about 35 scientists on board, and we have this beautiful old historical stamp. Um, in the video where you can see an outline of that, uh, of that ship. Um, the ship was heading first for Svalbard, uh, where she carried out a number of uh, oceanic research um, in the Greenland Sea. And then she proceeded east, so they turned around and uh, followed a little bit the ice edge uh, towards the north of Svalbard from Joseph Land and uh, Severnaya Semlia. Uh, they were implementing oceanographic, oceanographic traverse along the entire route. And during um, her voyages, the crew of the Satco discovered depth quickly exceeding 600 meters um, and dropping, uh, dropping when the, the ship actually traveled from the, um, from the New Siberian Islands uh, towards the north. And what they actually discovered there was the end of the continental shelf, the, the continental slope of the Kara shelf, if you will. However, they couldn't really... Um, and that kind of research because heavy pack ice just forced them to um, turn around. So in numerical terms alone, the achievements of that Satko um, expedition were just simply impressive. We're talking here about 85 days, which is steamed, and they were traveling 12,000 kilometers. Wow. And 6,000 kilometers of that alone, so half of it, um, was on on course laying north of the 80th parallel. So half of that, they were actually traveling further north than any other ship of that time. The scientists of the Satco had occupied over 100 oceanographic stations, uh, 51 gravity stations. They sounded 2,500 different depth points. They measured 13 magnetic points. They released 21 radio sons, a total of 20, uh, 227 sea bat samples. It's incredible, really, what they um, gathered on data. And the expedition has also discovered a new island, um, added considerably to the evidence that Gillis Land, which was uh, postponed uh, postulated in an earlier expedition as a, a possible land further north, and the Satko expedition just have proven uh, them wrong, did not exist. Um, the expedition also determined the submarine topography of the northern part of the Kara Sea. They occupied the first modern oceanographic station in the central Arctic basin and established a new record high latitude for freely navigating vessel. Most important of all, the meteorological and ice data collected had proved in valuable in helping to forecast conditions along the northern sea route. Something like that has never been done before. And in that extent, that stood quite for some time, that achievement. However, that was not the end of the line. Just a few months later, in 1936, just prior to the start of World War II, the next chapter basically was opened. And on the northernmost island of the Soviet Arctic, uh, on Rudolf Island of the Franz uh, Joseph Land archipelago, an expedition camp was um, was built for roughly 60 people. And they tried that um, during the summer of 1936. And they created an airfield, a phone connection, a radio beacon, and um, a lot of essential equipment to be able to 
operate in the area. And they did so because they actually intended to start an aircraft expedition of uh, four heavy and one light aircraft. And that expedition was under the command of Otto Schmidt and uh, was deployed towards the North Pole. They identified a four square kilometer large um, ice flow with a rough thickness of three meters at a latitude of 89 degrees and 26 minutes north. And they established on that ice flow a research camp for four researchers. And we had that on the um, on the website, a picture of those um, of those four researchers. And after 16 days where they set up the camp, um, the, the planes left and the expedition crew was left. The research station was named North Pole 1 and when the planes left on June 6, they began their autonomous drifting journey. So they were actually um, waiting for the ice, whatever happened uh, in that drifting period. The four explorers on the ice, they were uh, Ivan Papanin, who was the uh, chief of the station, um, Peter Shershev, the hydrobiologist, um, Yevgen Fedorov, the astronomer and meteorologist, and radio operator Ernest Krenkel. So there was four people. I would really like to really uh, stress that. They were on an ice floe 20 kilometers short of the North Pole, in June 1936, and the drift of the four of them continued for 274 days. Just just the four of them? Just the four of them and a tent. Days, wow. And a tent, okay. And it, so they were living in a tent. <laughs> and I would love to compare that to the incredible achievement of the Mosaic expedition, which lasted a year, but... The scientists there were in the comfort of the uh, Polar Stern Research Icebreaker of the Alfred Wegener Institute. Those four guys, they stayed almost an entire year on ice in a tent. That's crazy. The, the station drifted more than 2,600 kilometers from the original position where they actually took possession of. And they were actually obtaining the very first scientific observations from that high latitude. The uh, crew very regularly measured um, different uh, things like ocean depth. Uh, they took what not, um, soil samples. They measured water temperatures in different uh, levels. They took water samples from different levels. And um, additionally to all of that, also meteorological observations. So they were, not just, they were not just trying to survive. They were also doing <laughs> scientific work at the same time. I, I think the scientific work was um, the way of survival to, Probably, to keep yourself yeah. busy. If you if you remember, they got deployed in June thirty six and uh, thirty seven, and they traveled two hundred and seventy four days. So they actually came from summer right into winter. And winter is not just like in, in, in mid latitudes where you have a bit of snow um, possibility. It's not only incredibly cold, incredibly windy, it is pitch black for the most time of right. the season. Right, of course. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you need the science to, to not go crazy up there. Not start exactly. to, not to not start to, I don't know, eat each other or something. <laughs> And it took until February oh, 1938 for the North Pole Station to drift out towards the Greenland Sea. And then it took a number of attempts, but uh, eventually were, they were evacuated successfully with the help of an icebreaker. Wow. This expedition has um, proven that there were neither large land masses nor small islands in the vicinity of the North Pole. There was still some uncertainty about that. Remember... In the last episode about the Jeanette expedition, <clears throat> we briefly talked about the theory of the uh, open polar seas by the German uh, cartographer August Petermann. He was a, a big um, believer of there must be an open sea in the center of the um, Arctic Ocean. And there were other uh, scientists who were postulating land masses around the pole. But this expedition this uh yeah drift from pretty much the north pole all the way down to the greenland sea just proved them wrong so further the four 
researchers recorded the uh, relief of the ocean floor um, underneath them along the entire drifting track, um, as well as ocean currents of the upper um, Arctic Ocean, in, which is very much um, induced by wind. And they discovered that warm Atlantic water in the depth reaches uh, towards the pole. And they actually came up with the idea that in the abyss of the Arctic Ocean, the water temperature increases uh, due to the heat of the Earth. The opinion about livelessness of the near pole region was completely disproved. The water samples they uh, took from different um, levels of the Arctic Ocean just proved those kind of ideas completely wrong. The team also made very valuable magnetic and, and ice drift measurements and they actually um, found new regularities in Arctic climate. They discovered that cyclones bring rain, fog and really unstable weather um, into the Arctic and that this is not like a, a crazy um, once-in-a-lifetime experience, but it's very typical for the pole area, just like it is also for, for lower latitudes. The North Pole Station's uh, investigations, in particular the weather and magnetic observations, they opened the possibility for, for routine air routes across the Arctic. So they laid the base work of understanding how to navigate there. And after the expedition came to an end, the uh, four researchers uh, subsequently were named heroes of the Soviet Union. And in March 1938, so just a month after they got evacuated, they actually were conferred PhDs in geography based on their field work. A pretty amazing uh, story here. And this very first drift ice station collected such an abundance of information that the Soviet Union decided to continue the program even though it took them roughly 12 years for the next station to be deployed. And that's also a very interesting factor to see. So there was a very successful uh, scientific polar operation, and then it took 12 years to come up with a follow-up of that. And the follow-up was largely unknown to the, uh, to the Western countries at the time. Um, the North Pole 2 station was organized and deployed in 1950, and the observation carried out during um, the drift of North Pole 2, they showed that continu uh, continuation of the study uh, clearly was needed. After 1954, Soviet field work um, on the dr uh, drifting ice became a regular thing. So the Soviet Union deployed every year one, two, or sometimes even four ice comes um, into the Arctic Ocean. Wow. So Arctic studies over several decades were um, aimed at understanding the regularities of natural processes and um, particularly also how to forecast them. The drifting ice stations, they collected fundamental observational data. It's a lot of stuff you only can um, collect when you're on location. These operations continued then until 1991 when the station North Pole 30, uh, 31 was terminated. During the period of 1937 and 1991, 88 polar crews operated uh, the ice flows for a total number of incredible 29,726 drift days. That's crazy. It's just <laughs> mind-blowing. And they were drifting an accumulated distance of 169,654 kilometers, roughly 170,000 kilometers. The research program of the North Pole Drifting Station is, and that's really something we can say with certainty, unequaled in the 20th century by duration, by the variety of observational material, by the importance of the scientific discoveries, and the number of problems resolved in the scientific world. But with the end of the Soviet Union, also the drift ice station um, became uh, come to come to an end, and it took then another 12 years to. Uh, pick up the program again um, for the Russians in spring 2003 when they um, deployed the North Pole 32 crew. And so far, the last drift ice station was evacuated after only four months of operations with um, only 714 kilometers of drift in August uh, 2015 because the ice flow simply started disintegrated, uh, integrating. Very, very sad story.
Um, we have, I believe, a picture somewhere below where we can see. No, what we see is the um, privately run uh, Barneo Ice Camp, and that's also something the Russians have operated on uh, on the ice. So Barneo is more uh, tourism focused, and it is kind of a base camp for modern day explorers who want to reach the North Pole. And since 2002, this base has uh, been built on ice flows near the North Pole. But over the last years, uh, the ice conditions have become more and more unstable, and it has really troubled the uh, developers of that um, of that base. It's a bit like A68, right? Starting it is. to yes, yeah, just just to disintegrate. Pretty much, yeah. And in uh, 2018, the campers at Barneo, um, they needed to just pack everything together again and abandon the base only 12 days in. Whoop. So that was really a very, very short season. And uh, in 2019, the season was cancelled even before it could start because they couldn't get hold of a permission to actually fly um, the Antonov 74 aircraft uh, into the high Arctic. And the year later, in 2020, the camp was um, obviously cancelled uh, following the coronavirus pandemic. However, already since the mid-2000s, it's really becoming more and more difficult to find suitable ice flows for so, such drift ice stations or for the Barney Ice Camp. Um, and that's obviously due to global warming. So the ice is breaking up. It's that was forming. also part of the, uh, I remember, part of the Mosaic mission that they initially took quite some time to find the proper ice float to attach the ship to and to put some science on. I think there was the first two months where they yeah. were still looking out for, um, yeah, for a suitable ice flow to actually anchor at and to to deploy yeah. the uh, the scientists. Yes, uh, that's that's very true, and that is already happening since um, the mid two thousands. And the unexpectedly fast thawing ice is just making those ice uh, drift ice stations uh, nearly impossible, or they need to be. Um, evacuated just uh, very, very quickly. Uh, it took over a decade for the Russians to actually come to an agreement. And in December 2018, so a few years back, the first steel finally was cut for a project they called um, 00903 in so-called ice-resistant self-propelled platform. Two years later, in December of last year, the most unusual egg-shaped floating platform um, has been launched. And that whole thing is constructed from uh, special high durability steel. And it has been launched from uh, Russia's Admiralty shipyard in St. Petersburg. It's called Severny uh, Polios, which translates into North Pole. So it goes straight into the tradition of the North Pole drifting ice stations. And it is actually supposed to pre replace the previous ice-based drift expeditions and intended for multi-year drifting deployments into very, very high latitudes. Everything on this ship is purpose-built. And its purpose is to withstand extreme conditions and high latitude. Just look how it looks like. It's just... It's like it, an egg, it, yeah. <laughs> it, it doesn't look like a ship at all. The hull is shaped for a certain purpose, and I'm sure, Chris, you know um, what it's based on. Of course, of course. It's the Fram again. Exactly. It, it pushes up, I guess, when, when, it goes, when it goes in between big ice floats and they move towards each other. Exactly. So, Frick of Nansen has um, built the, or let build the, um, the Fram purposely for locking it into ice, and he knew that regular... Um, uh, ship structures would just be crushed by the ice flows um, over time. So he actually thought about how can we change um, the structure of the ship that the ship is not crashed but lifted out of the uh, of the ocean, and a very round shaped form came out, and that's what the Russians here took um, up as well. So they're just bringing the idea of. 1893 into the next level next century and the north pole ship is rather um, a self-propelled uh, research platform than a ship it had has its very own arc 8 
um, rating. So that's actually an icebreaker rating, just short one grade of the nuclear icebreakers, which are in the Russian uh, classification arc nine. On the screen, um, you see actually crazy. <laughs> right now, you see the reason why this ship is necessary and why those drift ice stations are simply let me, not working any longer. Let me, let me try to explain what we're seeing for those who are just listening to this. So this is... Um, well, it, it, if it was a proper ice float, it would be just a white surface. But this is like a bunch of tiny islands connected with big puddles in between. So you can't even walk from one to the other or you have to jump over little crevices. Um, some of those are as small as yeah, a tent size, pretty much. So this really shows how I believe how uh, yeah how, how the, everything's melting and how you cannot do these long drift expeditions on ice floats anymore. And it's very, very difficult. Um, the, those meltwater ponds, they actually collect water which is significantly warmer than right. the ice flow itself. So the water of the melt pond just cuts through the ice so those melt ponds just grow deeper and deeper and, and very think, very quickly and i think those ponds are also darker than the rest so they would yes. probably heat up even more yes exactly that's wow. exactly the point so the albedo here um gets much much lower um the the um the ratio of reflection of sunlight yes. and, and heat reflection is much much lower in the melt water ponds than on the ice and you can see there is barely a path from one tent to the other on that ice flow. Right. The likelihood of an ice flow that size breaking up has increased so tremendously that it's not a reliable um, yeah, base for a camp any longer. That's crazy. <sighs> so that's the, the, the reason why the Russians came up with the idea of having um, a platform on their own, which is... Um, you are able to bring itself into the um, destination, into the the area of um, of operation. They can lock that in, or they operate it for two years at a time, and it then gets resupplied with goods and personnel by either helicopter or other icebreakers. The ship has some flaws, obviously. I mean, uh, you sh you see the the axe shape form is not. Um, the best to go through rough sea. I don't want to be on it in the Drake Passage, to be honest. <laughs> um, and it also has some perks when it comes to speed, so it's limited to 10 knots speed. However, it's not a ship. It's a research platform. So being able to um, reposition the platform on its own is a huge advantage, so we don't see it here as a disadvantage. You can't you can't just put an outboard motor on an ice float. <laughs> I think that's difficult. Exactly, <laughs> but with the capabilities of the uh, Severny Polios platform, they uh, the Russians will restore the capabilities they lost on the drift ice stations, and they actually gain more of that. They have fifteen. Um, laboratory spaces on board with a full range of sensors for different kind of measurements like ge uh, geological, acoustic, uh, geophysical, oceanographic research. They have a number of um, laboratories on board. They have very nice comfy cabins on board. At least that's the plan. And the stuff can be deployed for quite some time, for two years uh, at a time. Obviously, the stuff won't be on board for two years, so they actually have an exchange like the um, the Mosaic expedition did as well. But the the base for executing um, scientific research has just reached a new benchmark with this platform. So this is really um, a great step forward. And currently, the platform has um, been launched into water, so it, it touched um, water in December of uh, 2020 and now is um, been outfitted in um, in St. Petersburg and that will take time till next year 2022. But with the drift ice stations, Russia and the Soviet Union have both laid the fundament of what's now turning into an understanding of the processes of the high Arctic. With the history in, in, in polar research, 
Russia claims that 70% of Arctic research has been conducted by Russian researchers. And given the size of the Russian part of the Arctic and also the Russian exploration history, that's not totally unreasonable, I have to say. However, the Drift Ice program eventually has inspired the most current Mosaic expedition, which um, put itself a year into ice, uh, deployed 600 scientists. It's just an incredible achievement. It's the largest expedition or largest single expedition um, so far uh, by the Alfred Wegener Institute um, in Bremerhaven. And I personally hope that the new research platform, um, Seven Polios, will participate in continuous research for a comprehensive understanding of the central Arctic basin in the Arctic of, uh, in general, and not only to underlie, uh, underline geopolitical positions, but that obviously is a topic on its own, and I'm very sure we're going to uh, attack that in one of the upcoming ep uh, episodes. Whoa, that that was oh, I I really enjoyed this one. I'm there, yeah, I did not know about the Russians uh, conducting that much of uh, of research over. Well, it still is kind time. of a black box for most people. Yeah, it's crazy. So anyway, thanks for your time. Thanks for bringing us this amazing piece of um, history and a look out into the future. Um, of course, we will be back with another episode uh, pretty soon. You can find us online at Curiously Polar on our website, curiouslypolar.com, on the social media. And with that, thanks everyone, and until next time. Bye bye.